Hello VC, I'm Dirk, welcome to the Five Hole. Today we're going to be talking about a special kind of recording called direct to disc recording. First though, I'd like to thank everybody who's subscribed to my channel. I've gone past the amazing milestone of 20 subscribers and uh, I'm really pleased that there's that many people out there that are interested in hearing what I have to say. Look forward to uh, providing you with some more videos in the future. So thanks for coming back. So, what is a direct-to-disc recording? Well, some of you have heard, probably most of you have heard, of uh, the type of recording called a one-step, which has been popularized uh, of recent years by um, Mobile Fidelity. And <clears throat> what a one-step is, we can look at our handy chart that's included, included with a one-step. Um, you can see the difference between a one-step process and a, um, a regular, uh, ordinary process for uh, creating vinyl records. Um, normally what they would do is they would take the recording uh, and they would transfer that with a cutting lathe. They would cut it onto a lacquer and that lacquer would get uh, coated with uh, metal and then that would become the, um, the father. So that's the step here. Then that father is used to produce mothers, which are um, a positive. Uh, they're they're basically the uh, the same as as the record is. Um, but then those mothers create stampers. So they're going to create a bunch of stampers from the mothers, and they're going to press maybe five thousand uh, copies per stamper, and then they're going to toss that, use a new one. And when they do a, a long run of records, they're going to go through a whole bunch of stampers. So with the one step, they're going to cut down that process. One step's a little bit of a misnomer, but you're going to take the original recording. You're going to cut the lacquer from the original recording. And then instead of a father, they call it a convert. So the convert becomes basically a stamper, but uh, they, they use these uh, these convert stampers for a much smaller run. So in the case of one steps, they might only be making, uh, you know, three to 7,000, uh, pressings for the entire run. <clears throat> so they might only have uh, a few converts that they actually uh, create. So, um, if you've listened to any of these recordings, you'll know that they, really sound great it's it's kind of the the current pinnacle of recording technology for vinyl um, the vinyl compounds they use have a lot to do with that uh, they have very very uh, quiet surface and uh, the recording process or the pressing process um, contributes to uh, really high fidelity um, they're, they're, you're not you're not wearing out the stampers the same way that you might with a longer pressing run um, they they tend to be such short runs that everything is really uh, really clean and new um, when they make the when they make the pressings so um, so like I said we've got you got one steps they're they're starting to become um, a standard for the the highest end of uh, different different um, labels so mobile fidelity is making them um, analog productions you've got your UHQR same idea um, craft recordings has got one coming out uh, and then they've got uh, impacts is making them as well so there's quite a few out there that are being made right now and they really do sound fantastic. So that's not exactly what we're talking about, though it's similar in some ways. So a direct-to-disc recording, what they do is they bring a cutting lathe into either a studio or they can bring it on location. And when the artists are playing their music, the cutting lathe is literally taking the signal from the microphones and it is cutting the, the lacquer right then and there. So 
there is no tape in the process. Sometimes they use tapes as a backup, but typically those are for emergency use only because um, the, the process is a bit tricky, as you can imagine. Um, you can't really make mistakes. You make a mistake and the lacquer is shot and you got to start over. So, <clears throat> um, so it, it is a, a, a bit of a, a challenging uh, process of making the records. Uh, probably nerve-wracking for the engineers and also for the musicians. It can be expensive if there's mistakes made. And um, you might wonder, well, why would you even bother doing it? You know, why not just put it on a tape or record it digitally? Well, the reason for that is <clears throat> every step that you get away from the original recording uh, becomes uh, a source of added noise and a reduction in fidelity so if you could somehow uh well obviously if you could sit there in the room and listen to them playing the music that's going to be the best possible situation um, if you could listen to um, a master tape directly that's going to be one step removed but it's going to be pretty darn close and it's going to sound fantastic and uh and then the records that are pressed from that if you have a, a the one-step process like in the case of mobile fidelity so it's pretty darn close to the master tape which is of course straight from the artist and they sound amazing but what if you could take a whole step out of there now direct to disc is even closer to really being a one step so when they have the recording going straight from the microphones into the cutting lathe and cutting that disc, cutting that lacquer, you are going to eliminate that entire tape or digital uh, portion of the recording. Um, now, digital, you're not going to have tape hiss, uh, but with tape, that is something that that is a reality. Uh, with the with the highest resolution recordings. If you have a system that can reproduce those sounds really well, you can hear the hiss of the tape in the background. Um, it's usually not real distracting. You can kind of put it out of your mind, but it is there. And it, uh, it, it doesn't muddy the sound, but it does, it does affect the sound in a way that makes it slightly, slightly less perfect. So, as I was saying, back in the day, when they were cutting 78s, you have the... Uh, musicians would come into a studio and they would have like a either a wax cylinder they may have even gone to a wax a wax disc but they would have what looks like the old time uh, megaphones that they would use for <laughs> that's sort of just like a conical tube and uh, that would focus all of the sound from the wide end which would point at the musician to the narrow end which would be pointing right at the cutting head. And the sound would get funneled down the cone. It would vibrate the cutting head, which would make the marks into the, the wax. And uh, that's what they would use to then press records from. So with the addition of modern techniques of uh, using microphones and, uh, and mixing boards, they're able to get uh, a much better signal from the musician to the cutting head and even even the the modern version using microphones it's not particularly new there was a, a lot of them that were done in the 70s um, this for instance was made in 1977 this is Les Brown and his band of renown goes direct to disc um, so they they uh, just brought a a cutting lathe right into the recording studio and they made the recording um, this is a pretty big band too um, something that uh, Herbie Hancock experimented with when he was doing some recording dates in Japan um, this was in let's see 79 um, I know he did at least two direct discs. Now this is a record store day reproduction of the of the original. I'd be really surprised if this was made from 
the original um, the original lacquers um, seems unlikely to me um, you know these are uh, made by get on down records they sound it sounds fine it's it's good um, I wouldn't say it's astounding though um, but it, it it sounds pretty good but the original one was done uh, as direct to disc and he made another one as well around the same time that uh, was that used the same process. Um, so something I just got in the mail a few days ago that was recorded in September. Now this one uh, is just phenomenal. Um, this is a recording made. Um, like, uh, I'm not sure when it was made, actually, now that, I, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, the recording was actually from uh, 2019. So this is a recording done direct to disc, but it was done 45 RPM. And it was made in Germany, in Bamberg. It's called Mavlast. Uh, forgive my pronunciation. I uh, I don't know if that's actually how you pronounce it. Um, uh, as you can see, it actually translates to my country. And uh, Smetana was the con the uh, composer, um, Czechoslovakian composer, and Bamberger uh, Symphonic Orchestra is who the, or the Bamberger Bamberg Symphony is uh, who recorded this with uh, uh, Jakob Hrusa as the conductor. Um, as I said, this is cut at 45 RPM. Um, it's three discs. And uh, this is phenomenal. It is, I, I'm, not, I'm not a tremendous uh, collector of classical music. Um, largely because most of the recordings that I have and that I've uh, listened to, uh, at least on my system, which admittedly isn't probably the best system for reproducing uh, symphonic music, but um, they've always seemed a little flat to me. They never quite they never quite had the pop of what you would experience when you listen to symphonic music live. Um, so this was recorded in the in the symphony hall in Bamberg, Germany. And um, it has four microphones. They had uh, a stereo pair that was right over the conductor's position. So you're gonna hear essentially exactly what the conductor would be hearing. And then I think they had one other pair of microphones that were used a little bit for uh, mixing in an ambient uh, sound of the room. Um, this uh, was only done to uh, 1,111 copies. Um, so when you think about that, that cutting process and, and pressing process, um, they could have done the entire run with just one, uh, one master, I guess you'd say, one, one, uh, one father. Um, so they, they would be able to take the, uh, they'd be able to take the master that they, uh, that they coded in metal and create one, uh, father from that and then stamp pretty much all of the records from that if they wanted to. I'm not sure if that's exactly what they did or not. Um, but it's, it's a really beautiful box set. It's in a, I don't know if you can see very well, but this is like a linen cover. inside it it comes with a certificate and it's uh, gives a little description of the the date when they recorded um, it's got a signature by Rainier Mallard who's the producer of the album and then it comes with this nice booklet let me set this down
and the booklet got the conductor Bedrick Smetana pronounce it as you like I'm not a student of classical music so I couldn't tell you for sure um, and then it's got the the tracks and then it's got some write-ups on the symphony and the history of it I know these don't look very interesting um, some photographs of the recording session and here's a list of all of the musicians involved and here's photographs of the process of producing the record so it's a really nice booklet and comes with three discs 180 grams vinyl um, and they're perfectly flat as you can imagine run this small their quality can control can be pretty extensive um, these came out beautifully uh, I should mention the label is Accentus Music um, I think they primarily specialize in classical music uh, these were pressed at Palace in Germany um, and I got to have a listen to it the other day when I came in the mail uh, I gotta say I was I was happy to get it because it came out uh, like I said in September and really there's there's none out there at all I went on to Amazon and I actually found it on Amazon through um, somebody third-party seller in England uh, but it was just sort of luck when I learned about this record I, I looked it up and that was the only place that I could find it for sale and it was the only copy that they had so this could very well be the last one out there I don't know um, anyway it's it's it really is a great recording uh, I listened to it with my daughter uh, and we were sitting there and I've never seen her close her eyes and listen to music the way that she was when we were listening to this and we got done and she just kind of looked at me and was like wow gosh I had my eyes closed and I started seeing all these stories forming in my head about the music <laughs> and uh, it, it is it's moving it's a it's very much like being in the symphony uh, and in symphony hall and hearing them playing it live uh, the the spatial reproduction um, I don't know if it's because of the recording process or the uh, the way that it's cut direct to disc whatever the case they did such a good job on this uh, you, you really get uh, a sense of a live symphonic performance that as I mentioned before I rarely heard um, particularly on my sort of uh, modest stereo system in fact it's a little embarrassing to have one of a thousand of these um, considering there's probably you know many many thousands of stereo systems out there that could reproduce this much better than I could but I'm very glad to have it um, and um, if you get a chance to, to check out a direct-to-disc recording uh, as I said before there's there's quite a few out there um, your mileage is gonna vary I know that this uh, this jazz one uh, the Les Brown yeah I, I don't think it's particularly highly regarded and and I and as I said there was a lot of them being done back in the 70s and to some degree it might have been a bit of a gimmick uh, but in the case of Mavlast I would say it's no gimmick and it's a really special recording and uh, I'm pretty happy to have it so thanks a lot for coming and listening to me talk uh, if you want to hear uh, more about some other albums I've got um, topics in music stereo uh, please hit the subscribe button 
like the video and leave comments below. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks for visiting. Bye.